Hello, my lovely soul, and welcome to Unstoppable Confidence. I am your host, Lauren Glick. I am here to bring you my energy, my motivational speaking, and me being a confidence mentor. My mission is to inspire women to own who they are, step into their higher selves fearlessly, and live a life with unstoppable joy. On this show, we are going to cover everything from aligning your life to your higher self, setting boundaries, self-growth, and living a purpose-driven life. Let's get you living a meaningful life you cannot wait to wake up to. Stop driving and start living with ease and abundance. Cheers to living a magical life. And I am so grateful to be on this journey with you. Now, let's head into today's episode. So hello, lovely soul. And today on Unstoppable Confidence, we have Kristen O'Donnelly and she is such a powerhouse in the way she speaks so confidently. And I really want to say that word eloquently. Um, she really does a lot within empathy research and really helps spreading the word of having the basic understanding of how somebody else is feeling. It's so challenging to understand our own words and our own thoughts, that the basic understanding of how somebody else is feeling is going to really help spread more love in the world. So on that lovely, I cannot wait for you to get into this episode. So on that, I mean, seriously, if you're out in the world and you're having all these crazy interactions with people, let's go back to empathy. So on that, let's go get into it. So hi, Kristen, I'm super excited for you to be here. For my podcast listeners today. Um, so Kristen, as I am going to introduce you, I would love for you to explain it to everyone. Kristen, Dr. Kristen O'Donnelly is one of the good doctors of Abbey Research. And I would absolutely love for you to explain that a little bit to the listener today. I'd be delighted to Lauren. This is so exciting. Thanks for having me. Of course. So the long answer is that my best friend and I are empathy educators and we both have PhDs. And so we call ourselves the good doctors and Abby research exists to help people understand themselves and others so that we can all have a richer human experience and live in a more cohesive world. Um, And so that's what Abbey Research does. It's part of a network of companies that my brother and I Mm co-own, which are all called Abbey something or another. Uh, We do everything from making stains that diagnose cancer to processing lumber. Um, And it's a real- what? I know. But all of them are connected by this mission statement, this vision that we have to impact lives and create holistic wealth. And so my brother currently does that through managing the manufacturing arms and making things that save people's lives, change people's lives. Um, we have, you know, job creation, things like that. And then I do it. I, I impact lives and create wealth through the generation of ideas and the education around empathy. So when we look at the global marketplace and the, and the way everything works right now, there's a couple of things we realize. One is that everyone has to treat their employees better because we all have to treat each other better. Yeah. <laughs> and we've, and then that's hard work that, up to, you know, the last couple of years, a lot of people have been very hesitant to admit how hard it is. There's been a lot of quick solutions and Hey, here's these five steps to doing this. And this is the, we've, we've treated human development, like a Buzzfeed listicle. Ah. And what Aaron, who is my best friend and partner and I are coming along and saying, so it's actually really simple, but it's all really hard at the same time. You have to listen to people better. You have to get curious about folks. And you have to mm. operationalize that curiosity and good news. That's all real straightforward if you want to do it. So that's Abby research in a nutshell. We do that <laughs> empathy education through a YouTube channel, a podcast, and then also in-person stuff. We do workshops and keynotes for organizations, but mm. it's a lot of help, just conversations, constant conversations around mm. helping people understand themselves and others. Ooh, I love that. 
before I forget the question. Um, well, first of all, Kristen and I definitely met in Clubhouse. I absolutely was drawn to your speaking and the way that you cared about other people all makes complete sense now. Um, what is your YouTube channel? I'll have you say it again at the end of the podcast, but just for the listeners right now. Yeah, it's real. We are not creative when it comes to naming. So everything yeah. is Abby research everywhere That's we easy. are and you spell Abby E Y. So it's A B B E Y research. And you'll mm. find where, uh, we've been going on four years now. So there's a couple hundred videos have fun. Mm. Um, but yeah, Lauren mentioned my speaking. I've gotten to do, I'm a four-time TEDx speaker as well. Yeah. And I spend a lot of time helping, uh, taking stages and having the privilege of spreading these ideas from that perspective as well. And I really absolutely loved that you said listening better really grows empathy. And I think when we don't have that connection with somebody else, like how could you even have empathy? There's so many people like I'm in LA. So maybe it's just like even more exploded, or maybe I'm just more conscious of the fact that people don't listen very well. Um, it's just a huge disconnect. Um, it's a massive disconnect everywhere because the deal is, well, I should say too, we view empathy as a mindset and not an emotional reaction to things. Ah. So empathy is a decision that you make all the time. It's a practice of a set of decisions to essentially become more informed about yourself and others. So you're making informed decisions if you want to be in relationship with people or not, because yeah. you can't actually really know what someone else is feeling, but you might be able to seek understanding about their context or their motivations or their history or their opinions, but we barely know what we're feeling as human persons. Yeah. So it's very difficult to say that, you know, what someone else is feeling. You may, um, you know, you may understand a situation that you live like it, you know, things like that. Yeah. But when we looked at as social scientists, I have a PhD in sociology and Aaron's is in anthropology and history. And we realized we read, we read a lot of research. We did some of our own and we, we looked at a lot of different disciplines and then we just actually went back to the dictionary. Yeah. And all the dictionary definitions include the word understanding. And not all of them include emotion. So we sat there and we're like, what does that mean? So we started teasing it out and we realized that that's actually pretty accurate. That understanding is a much broader thing than like, I feel how you feel. You can't feel how I feel. You don't, you're not in my skin, man. Like yeah. you're, you don't, you don't know me. You don't know because I barely know myself. I'm still on a journey of knowing myself. Mm. So we advocate empathy as a mindset, as a yeah. choice of as a posture, the way that you move through the world. So all of that has to include listening, but most of us are so desperate to be heard and haven't been heard for most of our lives that the minute someone stops talking, we'll start talking. And mm. we're seeking to help people create environments where they are both heard and are good listeners. And that is, again, all of this is real simple stuff. It's just, it's very, very difficult to put into practice because it's practice. Yeah. This is the part of being a human that requires practice, not just existing. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I definitely resonate with you. Um, this is something that I've been working on too, Kristen. It sounds like you have a, a longer story of really understanding other people, Um and I truly do hear you, especially being in the coaching world that people like to, I don't want to say pretend like they're helping, but they are just like throwing out all this information being like, this is going to help you without really understanding what your potential client or your client's, um, problems are. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely loved that. Cause I'm, cause once you start understanding your clients, you could actually help them a lot more. The thing is. I am allergic to one size fits all solutions. Yeah. And I've been doing some work with a strengths perspective, strengths finder coach. And she's like, and this is really right in your strengths profile. I was like, oh, good. So I'm not just like cantankerous. Yeah. Like this is actually like something that works with me. And I, different people are so different. And we have lots of, mm -hmm. lots of elements of sameness and lots of elements of overlap and places we can connect with people. But fundamentally we are all our own tapestry yeah. of so many things at once and pretending that what is going to work for this person is going to work exactly for that person mm. is challenging. It might. And so some of this is just gentling our words a little bit. 
Hey, this might be a really good fit for you. Hey, have you considered, Hey, I'd invite you to pay attention to rather than buy this or die, which is the way a lot of marketing works because you have to make someone afraid of something before they'll buy something. And that's kind of how this all happens. And so in our world, we ask people to ask more questions Mm. and seek more understanding rather than existing on assumptions and projecting your own views of things onto somebody else and assuming that you know who the person is because they look a certain way, wear a certain t-shirt, speak a certain language, have a certain job, dig into who they really are because we are all so many things all at once. Ooh, and I love that. And I really love it because gosh, when you mentioned it back to we don't even understand our own selves. How are we supposed to understand somebody else's feelings when we don't, when we're still trying to figure out our own? And that was like, oh, geez, Louise, Kristen, of course. Like, I was like, yeah, spot on, got that, okay. And that's challenging as a coach to be like, okay. And that's the thing is I, I ask a lot of questions in coaching as well. Cause it's like, a lot of it is the understanding and wanting to help from that understanding perspective, but people want to drive forward so much that it's like, okay, we, we get to understand before we get to move. So that is always a challenging aspect as well. I can imagine. And I would assume for some folks, it's a more circle than a Mm -hmm. linear thing. So you understand a piece of this, you make a decision, you move, and then it reveals something else. And then it's, we have a deep belief with humans that grow as humans, we're like, Oh, all growth should be linear. Once I make this achievement, I'll never have to do it again. And it's one of the biggest lies we live under growth is a cycle. It's a, sometimes you do have to learn the same lesson 700 times Mm. and you need to see things from a different perspective or something that somebody told you on a Tuesday is going to smack different on a Friday because what happened on Wednesday shifted how you see the world. Growth Mm. is cyclical it's not linear in the same, in the way that we want it to be. Well, you just definitely, you, you just, you coached me on that one. Cause I just, for everyone listening right now, I just got off the phone with my therapist and she was like, no, Lauren, you're actually learning. Like just because you're reaching out as an entrepreneur for this new business venture, you're like, you wouldn't have known about point L without going through the whole alphabet before. So yep. you, we get to really diagnose like what we've been through. And if that quote unquote shiny object in front of you is really something that you want, or is it something that's like that hamster wheel that we're just learning? Oh, I see that. Okay. And I'm going to keep moving. So it's an interesting thought. Being a human is hard. Yeah. And there there's part of me that doesn't think we say that enough. Like this no, is don't. all really hard Yeah, and we all need a nap and it's <laughs> all going to be okay. All of those things, like it's all really hard and we're not biologically wired. We're not socially wired to do it alone. Yeah. And then, especially in North America, we do a whole workshop actually on um, unlearning exhaustion Ooh. and how, and how to figure out how to build different patterns in you that don't feed this exhaustion cycle we're all on. And one of the things that we talk about is that American kind of civic religion, as it were, is individualism. And we have this deep belief that you have to do it alone um, because that's what, what, what it's worth. That's what makes you worthy. But going it alone is not actually impressive. It's imbalance. Like we need to do it together because we actually can't do it alone. We end up burning out, cycling out, not being as innovative as we could. Mm. Homogenous, while I will make the argument that there is no such thing as a homogenous team, Mm. a team that is treated like a homogenous team makes significantly less product progress in any project than a group that is treated as heterogeneous. And all of the different facets of humans are allowed to play out and be together. So we're meant to live life in community and an authentic um, community where people call us on our junk and love us and we are seen and we are known. And that's how we thrive best. Getting there is a lot of damn work. Yeah. It's a lot of damn work. And it's a whole lot easier to not do the work. Mm. 
but the richest version of humaning is doing that work. Girl, there was a, definitely a reason why we got on this podcast today, for sure. It was like right along and right in sync with everything that I've been thinking about this past week. I really want to know how you got involved with, um, you said you have your PhD in sociology, right? Yep. Like, have you always, what is the definition of sociology? Like I've heard about it, like people definitely major in it, but what is the definition of it? It's the analytical study of society. So just like, just like doctors study bodies, I study mm-hmm. society. Mm-hmm. Anthropology tends, so the difference between sociology and anthropology is that anthropology tends to study, this isn't necessarily true anymore, but historically, anthropology studied societies that either once were yeah. and kind of aren't anymore or are far removed from the culture, like from the from Western culture. Yeah. Um, and sociology studied Western culture. That is no longer true. And the two really bleed together. Mm. Um, and as, as somebody who is in a lifelong friendship covenant with an anthropologist, I will tell you, we are both very comfortable saying that we know each other's disciplines really well, Yeah. but there's a lot of people that will like draw a line in the sand and be like, no, this is no, there's no real difference. <laughs> like historically there was, they started from yeah. very different places, mm. but we all use the same theories. We all kind of see the same things. Now I do tend to see things from more of a giant meta systems perspective of a whole global situation. And yeah. when I go to anthropology conference conferences, it is often a little bit more focusing on the local. Mm. That's not a rule. That's not like, that isn't the, the, the definition, but Aaron, my, my, to give you a kind of example of our PhD. So my PhD research was on studying a congregation, a Protestant congregation and writing about how people use words to create community, that we create meaning through language. Wow. And we all become, we all decide who we are. Like every group of friends has their own language. So every classroom has its own language. Every team has its own language. We all create our own language. Yeah. But I was doing it like contemporary. It was in 2012, 2013, 2014. Aaron studied how handicrafts created identity for people that were in prison in 1972. Interesting. So hers was much more, also anthropology has a lot more to do with physical things yeah, and like around that kind of stuff. Sociology, like we are just interested in how humans create meaning through the systems we exist in. And mm. it's why, like, I will say one of my TEDx's is that there is no such thing as normal, that the lie of back to normal is what's, is killing us all. And yeah. we, there's only forward momentum because we each create society, recreate society every day in all these kind of things. So that's basically the thing, like they deal with more material culture. Sometimes we deal with more just human culture, but there's yeah. so much overlap. There are, there are universities that have, that don't have an anthro department that absolutely teach anthro just within their sociology department. Interesting. So, so ha- there's somebody you- who's going to be mad at you in the comments that I said that, but that's honestly, what <laughs> <it is. laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm, but that's the thing is like going back to being nicer, kinder, more gentle people. Everyone always has something to say. Oh yes. We all have opinions. Yes. Yes. Especially with social media. It's a big thing these days. I'm like, come on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's so interesting, but we'll leave that for another time. So within your studies, is this always something that you've been really interested in? Like, how did you get into researching about human behavior and empathy? Like, was that something you were interested in throughout your whole life? I have been interested in humans my whole life Mm. for sure. And I thought I was going to do a lot of different things. So I was raised by it, my family is incredible. My dad's yeah. an entrepreneur and Ooh. he started our, the business that my brother and I now own 30 years ago. So I was raised wow. in a small business, entrepreneurial manufacturing family. And we, in my, one of the reasons my dad and his then business partner bought the company that they bought to start this business mm. was to create job opportunities with no skill manufacturing to mm. back to Philadelphia, that you didn't need any special trade training. You didn't even need to be literate. Yeah. to come to work. How do we do huh. that? There has to be a way. So 30 years ago, we started the, this practice that we still have, which is to work at, there's at least one job in our factory at any given time where you do not even need, you don't need to do anything, but show up sober every day and on time. I like it. And we'll train you with everything else you need to know. There's always at least one position. There's usually most that's usually that there's usually more than one. Yeah. And I grew up watching this. I grew up 
with it with one foot in suburbia and one foot in center city and Mm -hmm. and the and not just center city but like the different neighborhoods and my parents were very intentional we i grew up in a in a protestant faith community as well we're very intentional uh, about what loving your neighbor actually looks like and part of loving your neighbor means knowing your neighbor yeah and and understanding simple facts about your neighbor. I, re- I was 11 the first time I was shown the average income where we live and the average income where our employees lived and what demographics mean and demographics look like. And we started talking about where, be- you know, I call it now postcode privilege, yeah. but like where you are born in this world determines so many things outside of your control. And so how do we help people that both make poor decisions, have poor decisions made for them, And then a combination of all those things, how do we help them be their best versions of themselves? Not our version of them, not what other versions have been put on them, but how do we leverage privilege for the power of others? What do we do? So I've been asking that question forever. I did it from a faith perspective for a long time. I was a youth worker. Um, I have one of my master's degrees is in divinity. So I'm an ordained minister Mm -hmm. and thought a lot. I think a lot about people's belief systems in supernatural deities, whatever that looks like. And then I hit my PhD and my major question was around the country of Northern Ireland. Cause that's one of my major research focuses. Yeah. And I was living there and I had met the guy that I ended up marrying and I'd met my best friend. And what I realized is that what all of my education had taught me was how to ask good questions. You are very and, good at that. I must oh, say thank you. <laughs> like how to ask good questions and how to how to and to believe that different people are different Mm. and that everyone's humanity is valid Mm. and when I looked at all that and I looked at I listened to my brother and some of his friends and my dad and some of his friends and some of the marketplace stuff I was like okay well I could stay in academia and I could keep all of this training that I've been given at world-class research institutions I could keep it in the academy yeah where it will do no good And it will, all it will do is I will give my intellectual property away to whatever university I'm trying to get to hire me. Yeah. Or I can take all of this and help employers and employees work together better. Mm. So that was the original impetus. I emigrated home from Northern Ireland with my husband, uh, ended up working with my brother here at the factory. I did some in-house HR. I did a lot of consulting for some small businesses, helping them learn to ask questions of their employees instead of assuming something kind of doing, if anyone's familiar with, you know, uh, with trauma-informed care, kind of teaching small Mm -hmm. business owners how to do (laughs) trauma-informed leadership in a way within their Mm -hmm. organization. And then, and hired Erin after she finished her PhD in 17, uh, 2017, she emigrated home. We started working together and then honestly lockdown hit. Yeah. And we were, we spent just like everybody else, our lives on Zoom together because she lives in Pittsburgh and I live in Philadelphia and they're about four hours apart. Mm -hmm. And so we started running our whole business over Trello, Google Docs, Slack, and Zoom. Yeah. And we started really looking around and taking a break and taking a break from like the churn of what we had been doing and saying, okay, what is this? What is at the core of all of these problems? Mm -hmm. What is at the, what is the core need here? And why can't we all get along? I mean, the summer of 2020 wasn't just COVID. It was a lot of things. It was a lot of things. Why is this so difficult to understand? Why are people so defensive? Why can't, why can't people understand that racism is systemic, not individual? Sometimes it's both, Mm. but most of the time, you know, it's all of these kind of things. What we got, what we just kept drilling down and asking ourselves and going back and back and back is that we are never given the permission to ask each other questions. Mm. Or to un- or to understand ourselves or each other other people, and that connection. There are lots of people who are very keen on understanding themselves, and that's a brilliant. And there's people that are keen on understanding other people, but there's not a national or international conversation about bridging those two things or a word yeah. we can use for them. And so we started investigating empathy, and we started really looking at like the work that Brene Brown had done around vulnerability yeah. and how she reframed that. And we were like, we can do this for empathy. We just have to start getting some really intentional with it. So we started doing some more, some more secondhand research, some anecdotal research, drawing some things together. And by we, by the time we hit kind of the middle of 21, I had already given one TEDx. I was about to give a couple others. And we were like, this is what, this is what we want to do. Like, this is what we're called to. We deeply want to help people understand themselves and others. So mm. that's the, in this, this short answer is that I've cared about people for as long as I've had cognitive thought. The longer answer is that 2020 crystallized 
mm. some things we, we are not alone in that we know but yeah. crystallize some thought processes and some goals and some ways that we could show up in service to the planet that we had been flirting with before, but now we are fully committed to. No, I could see how COVID really did help you um, move forward with your work because it's so interesting. Well, during COVID, I don't know, like everyone was doing different things, but I definitely like was in lockdown, didn't really go outside to talk to many people. A couple months ago, I started playing soccer on a co-ed team and It is really crazy, like exactly what you said. People are extremely defensive and every single one of our games, there was a fight. That is not a common thing in soccer. So, or at least the soccer teams I've played in and I've played. No, it's not a common. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason we don't pass out that many red cards in the sport. So I know. And I'm like, holy moly, like this is like, like, and that's the thing, even walking off a soccer field, like somebody would be saying something really aggressive or mean and I'm like what is going on what with the happening? world yeah yeah so I absolutely love what you're doing with teaching it, people about empathy because I think it's extremely important right now um so within your teachings so you have your TEDx those are mm-hmm. on YouTube correct two out of two of them are up at this moment as you and I talk yes and they are on YouTube and TED.com Okay. And then other than that, how can people find you? Because I think it's really important to spread the word about empathy and really understanding human behavior and the fact that we get to understand ourselves and communication. I've absolutely enjoyed today um, was needed. Always a constant um, reiteration. I I absolutely love having these conversations. So how can people find you? The best way is the YouTube, um, okay. especially if, or, and we have our own podcast. So if you are mm-hmm. listening to this and you're like, I really, really hate YouTube friend, I get you. I didn't yeah. watch YouTube at all until the lockdown and now yeah. I'm on it. So amazing. Um, but we repurpose a lot of our YouTube content into a podcast that is called the culture cast. And that comes out three times a week. And Aaron and I will talk to you about learning empathy through both popular and lived culture. So Ooh. some of those conversations are like, how do we learn empathy through, Hallmark Christmas movies. How do we learn empathy through Hulu's dope sick is what we're covering right now. Um, and talking about the opioid crisis and how do we deal with empathy around that. And then we also have every Wednesday, the episode is about kind of more lived stuff. So recently we've talked about, um, why, why going to crowd events is important in light of the astro world tragedy. We've talked about parasocial relationships and why everybody, why the internet decided to send death threats to Jake Gyllenhaal after Taylor Swift released red. Mm. We, we talk about those kind of things. How do we help you understand society better um, yeah. so that you can understand yourself better? So that's the podcast. The YouTube channel is great. We got a newsletter we have, all, and we're on all the socials except for TikTok because it scares us, but we can, we are on all the other socials. I'm overwhelmed by TikTok. I don't start. I'm so overwhelmed. I was like, Kristen, oh, like, what do you mean? She like, that's the funny part is I have my like podcasts that are just throw reels on it. But other than that, like, yeah, I'm, we do reels. And Mm -hmm. so it's one like, but what works on reels and what works on TikTok. And when I talk to people, like, it's just, it's a little bit awkward. So, um, I, (laughs) And it's just a little bit weird, but, um, it's so I say all the time, it's like, I have three postgraduate degrees and I'm a published author and what will kill me on this planet is figuring out Instagram hashtags. That is what will bring me down on this planet. Um, (laughs) research genocide for like 20 years, but what's going to, what's going to actually end my soul is hashtags. So they just, they do my nut, but yeah, so you can find us on just about anything. And then as Lauren said, I'm on clubhouse on the reg. So you can always come and hop on clubhouse. Um, but yeah, the podcast, the YouTube, we'd love to chat with you. We are big fans of conversation. Yes. And Kristen's rooms and clubhouse, like every time she's talking, I really, really, really tried to join because they were so thought provoking. Um, so if you haven't gone on clubhouse in a while, just go to Kristen Donnelly's, um, that is your name on clubhouse, right? Kristen, Kristen Donnelly, PhD. Yeah. There you go. And then all you do is press that little bell in her profile. So you could get updates on when she starts rooms. Um, and we are in rooms, um, not often as much anymore, but I'm going to get back into your rooms, Kristen, cause it's just been, it's been a crazy past couple of weeks, you know? Yeah. You've had a bit of a time, but listen, like, yeah. and clubhouse can't decide what it is right now. No, it can't so decide it. It's trying, it's trying hard to be a lot of things and the, <laughs> the and will, when it figures out which one it wants to be, yeah. we'll be there. But yeah, yep. no, it's a, uh, 
it's been a minute since we got a chance to talk. So yeah. I'm really glad to see you again. Likewise, Kristen. So thank you so much for joining and giving so much insight on empathy today. Cause I think it's such an important, I want to say like understanding of how to even understand yourself and other people within communication. Cause things are getting crazy out there. Well, they have been, but. And they're not going to get, they're not going to calm anytime soon. I don't think no. so. We need to learn how to exist in this version of culture that we've created. Yes. So I always like to think is when people like on, at the soccer team at the soccer field, cause it's been a, like a couple months and I'm like, I was really thrown off by it. Cause I hadn't gone and talked to people in public in a year and a half. And when somebody really gets aggressive with me, I literally just stand back and think, what, how are they in that position right now that they're getting so upset about something so silly and minuscule? And one of the things I always joke is that it's, it's the, the story goes in, in church studies, by the way, yeah. that when they teach pastors that are going into new churches, there's going to be conflict because every yeah. congregation has conflict. And one of the jokes is like, it's never about the carpet color. So whenever <laughs> somebody comes at you and they're like, I'm really pissed that you're changing the carpet color in the, you know, in the sanctuary, or it's never about the drums that you're adding to worship. Yeah. So in that way, it like, it's not about the carpet color is one of my like basic human lenses, I guess. So somebody comes at me for something and I'm like, it is not about, it's not about the carpet color. So what yeah. is going on right now? This is there. They can, even if they're mad at me, this isn't about me. It's because not. This is, disproportionate response. Yeah. It's so, like, what's going on inside of them that if, if it's not about the carpet color. So what is it about? <laughs> and that's, that's one of the questions, honestly, that had, that not only drives our work, but very honestly has helped. I don't have a lot of the anxiety around social interactions that a lot of my colleagues or friends do yeah. that don't move through life with that lens. Mm. And they do take things very personally, or they do get very anxious around personal interactions. And I'm just like, just, it's not about you. It's really not about you. I had to learn the freaking hard way too. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's challenging to believe because it's very easy to feel attacked, but that is a feeling, yeah. not a fact. And so you just move through, but yeah, life's hard out there. Being a human's hard. Everything's hard. Take a nap, eat the ice cream, move on. On that, I'm going to go eat some ice cream, Christy, because I'm like, I need some ice cream right now, but I absolutely loved your words and you. really go out there and spread love. If somebody is spewed in some bad words at you, be like, just breathe and respond with kindness. <laughs> Great motto. Thanks, Lauren. All right, Kristen. Thank you so much. Bye. I hope you are so excited about where you're going because I know I'm excited for you. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you loved this episode, it would mean the world to me if you shared it with a girlfriend or posted it on social media, tag me so I could personally say thank you. I am so grateful. And until next time. <laughs>